My name is Larkin Green, and if you're in this room, you are here to learn something about synthetic shoes. But given the time constraints, we're going to have to focus on synthetic shoes proportionally. So uh, because of the, the scope of this category, there are a lot of shoes out there. I can't detail all of them. So my goal here today is to describe what these shoes are made of, how they're applied, some of the advantages and disadvantages, which are sometimes one and the same, and to hopefully incite you to go to these manufacturers and talk to them, and more importantly, talk to the folks that have actually applied these. Because I guarantee you, all of these have been applied successfully, and no doubt they've also been applied um, incorrectly as well. And so um, um, my hope is that you will check some of these out, because every horse at some point in its life could benefit from one of these devices. So I know what you're going to say when you see some of these, you're going to say, I can't see ever putting that on a horse. Um, but don't discount them just because they're pink or they have a funny name or a fancy name. Uh, every one of these devices can be used at some point in your practice. And you probably should pick a couple of them and figure out what might work for you and hopefully add them to your toolbox. So what you're seeing here is 15 examples of synthetic shoes on the market right now. There's a couple more being introduced at this summit. So you'll, you'll learn about those probably tomorrow. But So what I'm going to do, I'm going to back up and I'm going to go through these just and give you the names of them just so you're familiar with that. And then we'll start talking about them in, in general. So this is an Easy Walker, Happy Hoofwear, Polyflex, uh, Equiflex, Polysteel, Dalric, Ground Control, Equiphotic Sneakers, the Easy Shoe from Easy Care, uh, Ponywear, Epona Shoe, Nanoflex, uh, Glue Shoe, <coughs> Pro Glue, Imprint, and Flex. Now, I'm sure there's pro I probably missed a few in here, but uh, these are the ones that have access to right away. So let's look at the advantages and the drawbacks of these materials. Some of these things are pretty simple, and others have a considerable amount of engineering that goes into them. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're better, but uh, that I'll leave up to you. So the first advantage is weight. Now, on a, on a standing horse or a walking horse, weight's not that significant, but I think everybody can agree that you've got a four-foot pole, and you put weight on the end of it and start swinging it around, uh, weight becomes pretty significant. And though most of these shoes were born out of therapeutic need, there are some that horses can actually live in. And of course, the, the manufacturers, that's what they want. So weight is fairly significant with a lot of these. Some of them are you know, three to six ounces, or generally about a third the weight of a steel shoe. Uh, if a comparable steel shoe might weigh a pound, these are generally between three and six ounces. Not all of them, but but most of the, the, the lightweight ones. Now the next two things I'm going to talk about is where some of these manufacturers are going to throw some science at you, or pseudoscience as it were. Um, you'll hear terms like uh, modulus of elasticity, and durometer, and shock attenuation. My personal favorite, uh, a term that was actually uh, trademarked by one of these companies, biomimics. And so when they say this biomimics the foot, that sounds pretty good, especially to an owner. I don't know any owner that wouldn't want to hear that. Uh, so, you know, words are powerful, but um, along with that, you will also see the old disclaimer, and especially the ones that, um, that try and throw some science at you. If you search hard enough, you'll probably find a disclaimer, something like this, that basically says, we believe we know that this works, but there's really no science to back it up. Uh, but as the end users, what we really want to know is, are these shoes, can we apply them with, that, with a reasonable amount of effort can we keep them on the horse, and are they going to help the horse? And that's really all you need to know about these things. Like I said, every one of these things uh, can be used successfully if, you, if they're applied properly. Most of these materials, they're made of either polyurethane, rubber, or plastic, or some combination of that. But polyurethane is probably the most popular material to use for these, because polyurethane is known as a material that dampens vibration and absorbs shock very well. Uh, better than rubber, better than uh, plastic, certainly better than, than metal. 
Um, so it's pretty well known that, that polyurethane is, is a great material for that. That's why it's in all your running shoes, um, all of your cars and trucks, the bushings, and shock absorption um, uh, devices on, on all of our automobile, automobiles are now made of polyurethane because it's an extremely durable material and it absorbs shock and vibration very well. The next thing is that they talk about is elasticity, flexibility, and, and those are actually two different things. Elasticity is the ability to, to flex and then return to its normal shape. Uh, flexibility is, is pretty self-explanatory, but um, you'll see these types of diagrams and where they're showing you know, a rigid steel shoe on uneven ground, and they talk about how that, that affects the joints above it. Um, a horse that takes this type of step is better than a horse that takes this type of step. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, one thing that I do know that's true is, again, for an owner, that when you start talking about flexibility, an owner is going to be all over that. So I'm going to kind of leave that up to you. I, I don't really know. You know, it's uh, flexibility is like traction. It's like how much is enough, how much is too much, how much is not enough. So flexibility is something that some of these um, talk about at great length, both for um, you know allowing the hook mechanics to operate and also for, to increase blood circulation, which I think is another kind of a marketing term. But I know one thing, if I'm going on a backpacking trip, I'm not going to wear a shoe like this. I don't care if they say it biomimics the, the human foot. I'm going to wear something like this. I want something rigid. I want something that supports. And my joints can take the uneven ground. So flexibility is something that I, I don't know how much of an advantage it is. But these things are, these are the big three that the manufacturer will talk about. And you know they're and they're true for the most part. So if that's something that you're looking for, then that's great. Some of the other advantages are traction. Um, some of these devices provide a lot of traction, great traction, uh, especially on dry, rocky trails. However, polyurethane has one drawback, and that is traction on wet grass is not too good, and on ice as well, or ice, an icy snowfield. So. Generally, traction is pretty good, and what goes along with that is durability. Some of these shoes can be reused. Um, they wear extremely well, and, uh, and so they're pretty durable. The increased blood circulation, some manufacturers really talk that up. Others don't touch it because they know, well, you know, it's, that's pretty subjective. So the cost, cost is a fairly significant um, issue here with these materials because um, some of them, generally, they range from about you know, ten dollars to about thirty-five dollars, and there's a couple of them that are even more expensive than that. But for the most part, you can you can get some very usable um, synthetic shoes for ten to twenty dollars a piece. I'm not talking about pairs. Per shoe, ten to twenty dollars. Um, and when you start adding some of the accessories that come with them, like studs, um, some of them have removable uh, uh, clips, um, casting hooks, and things like that. The cost goes up pretty significantly. So. Um, you've got to keep that in mind. So let's take a look at the application. Um, there are generally three ways to apply a synthetic shoe. You can nail it on, you can glue it on directly, or you can glue it on indirectly. And so let's take a look at those methods. Oh, by the way, this particular one, you can also, on their website, they talk about using black drywall screws. But as you might imagine, uh, those pictures are kind of hard to come by. But, uh, but that is one method. So basically, you can nail, screw, direct glue, indirect glue. Nailing sometimes presents a problem, as with everything that we do. You've got to use the right nail. You've got to use the nail that's recommended by that manufacturer. And as you can kind of tell by this picture, the, the crease here doesn't do a whole lot to hold the nail in. Um, this one's a little bit twisted. But one of the most important things is these nails, they travel through these materials much differently than hook. And so you can't just start pounding a nail in. You don't know which way it's going to go. So most of the time, you're, you're drilling a pilot hole in order to do that. And then they also have a special tool. Um, you need to use a punch, because you can't use clinchers. You need to use a punch or a special tool like this to actually seat the nail head down into the material. If you do that properly, it can be somewhat difficult to get them out. You've got to use crease nail pullers, and even then, it can be a challenge to get some of these things out. But, um, it's very important that you uh, that you nail these according to the directions. Again, you can see here, this is a shoe that, that you're basically trimming off excess, so there's not a lot in that crease that's going to hold the nail in, so you really got to get those things seated into the material itself. 
Okay. Then the other method is basically gluing. And so you're going to use one of two materials, polyurethane or acrylic. So let's do a quick comparison of those two materials. Polyurethane is pretty much known as the high strength material uh, that we have today as part of the adhesives. Um, acrylics are, have moderate strength and you can approach the strength of a polyurethane. You just need more of it. Okay, so you need more glue. Second thing is vapor. Um, any of you that use these materials, you know one of them smells, one of them doesn't. Polyurethanes, no detectable smell really, and acrylics outgas that give off vapors on their way to being set. And so you need to use them in a, a well-ventilated area. And related to that is a chemical attack that happens uh, against the surface, that, the hoof surface that it comes in contact with. And so if any of you have used acrylics, you know that sometimes pull that off and there's a spongy wall underneath it. You can combat that a little bit with by uh, mixing copper sulfate, in, uh, grinding it into a powder, mixing it into the adhesive, and that seems to help a little bit um, with the chemical attack. Um, the heat generation cycle is different from these materials. All the things generate heat immediately when they're mixed, and then after about four or five minutes, they start to lose that heat pretty rapidly. By contrast, acrylics have what's called a back cycle exotherm, which means they have sort of a long, slow ramp up uh, to their ultimately high temperature, uh, to, the, to their highest temperature. So you're exposing the foot to more, more heat over a longer period of time. So you need to be kind of aware of that if you're working on something that's really short. Because you can, with both of these materials, the more bulk you have, the hotter they get. And so you've got to be careful of thermal abscesses. Uh, and then the shelf life. Um, with acrylics, you don't want to buy more than you need. You know, buy what you need that day and use it. You can't store it too long. Okay, let's talk about fitting. So some of these have a metal wire in them where you can actually shape them by hand uh, uh, using uh, a stall jack or the hardy hole on your anvil or uh, the trimming cams. And you can shape them and, and have them hold that shape. Others use kind of a bridge system uh, which um, is for fitting the heels. You either bolt on a various sizes of bridges, or in this case, you're actually inserting various widths of inserts to fit the heels while you're, while you're putting them on. And then these that have a cut, all three of these basically have an aluminum shoe in, uh, encased in plastic. And these present a problem with fitting because you've got that, you kind of got the toe stop. So that limits your ability to fit them to a certain extent. You also have to be careful that you don't get um, adhesive builds up in the toe, you can add toe length pretty quickly if you don't pay attention to the buildup of adhesive in the inside the shoe. And the trouble is you can't really see where the glue is going. So that's, that's kind of an issue. And then a lot of these are basically uh, trace and trim. Put the foot on the shoe, you trace the outline of the hoof, and you trim off whatever's hanging over. And sometimes that, you know, that works pretty well. Okay, and then this one is kind of a standalone. This is an imprint. This is made out of thermal plastic and it's glued on with acrylic glue. It's out of the UK. But you heat this up and soften it because it's thermal plastic and then you can mold it to the foot and then you glue it. Um, these, are, these are pretty spendy. If you go on the website, you won't find anything that says cost. But on some of the forums, they say, you know, 100, 100 to 150 pounds, uh, British pounds. So they're pretty costly. But that doesn't mean that there's not an application for it. Okay, so hand shape, bridge spacers, trace and trim, those are the application methods.